ellipse using the D tensor that I talked about in my second lecture. Now, if you would take this circle and cut it in two and move it like this, then the deformation is localized in the area of the cut. This and this doesn't deform at all, and all the deformation is localized in this sharp zone. That is what I call localized deformation. And localized deformation is beautifully illustrated by this statue, which is in the center of Maastricht. Maybe some of you have actually seen it. If you go from the station to the bridge, when you look at this guy from the front, it looks a normal kind of person. But if you go around, you see it like that it is like this. So this figure was deformed in a very localized fashion. These are just horizontal folds in this structure. Localized deformation. So I've already given you some clues about how complex folds really are. Let's now talk about, just a few minutes, let's now talk about why folds are important. Well, if you don't understand folds, you cannot understand the crust of the earth. Folds are everywhere. Folds are big, folds are small, and uh, to describe the structure of the crust, you must understand folds. Folds are a major scientific challenge. There have been many tens of thousands of studies about folds. If you go into Google and type in folds, not the psychological one, but the geological fault, you will get 20,000, 30,000, maybe 100,000 hits, very, very many. But in fact, we really don't understand very much about the way faults are moving and the way faults are formed. And in the master and maybe later in the PhD, uh, in the geoscience uh, study, you will learn more and more about the secrets and the mysteries of faults. Faults are major chemical reactors in the Earth. Many ore bodies, gold or lead, zinc, are formed in connection with faults. If you don't understand faults, you cannot understand the accumulation of many ore bodies. Faults are quite a lot of times seismic. And if you want to understand seismicity, if you want to predict earthquakes sometime in the future, you must understand faults. Uh, resource accumulation, of course, the ore bodies are just one example. Other examples are oil or gas, but maybe groundwater. Faults can have major effects on the way that groundwater is moving through the crust. And structural damage, well, earthquakes, which rattle houses, and the houses might fall over. Those are, again, effects which are really related to faults. So I wrote down in this slide some of the more important attributes, the properties or the attributes of faults. And I've talked about some of this. The time of the motion is important. Some faults are active today. Maybe they have just slipped yesterday or they are slipping at the moment. Some other faults are inactive. If you go into the Eiffel Mountains, I can show you beautiful faults and these have not moved for many, many years or many, many millions of years. Some faults are, have moved in the past, then they were silent for a long time and they are reactivated. There are beautiful examples all over our planet their faults are reactivated. So they are silent and they move. They could move in a different direction again. Faults are weaknesses in the crust. Okay? If you have already formed a fault, it is often easier to move it again than to create a new one. The mechanical properties of faults are important, and I will talk about that later in this lecture. I have already explained to you friction and, of course, faults are objects which move 
against friction. The energy rate is a complicated term to say that some of the faults are seismic, earthquakes, some faults are aseismic. The geometry, I will come back to this. Some faults are very big, some faults are much smaller, and faults can be segmented. And I will explain segmentation to you later in this lecture. The kinematics, normal faults, strike stick faults, reverse faults, the technical term for that is kinematics. Of course, the term comes from kino, motion. The surface processes, this is what you will hear a lot about in the neotectonics lecture of Klaus Reichetter. Folds which are moving and make steps in the Earth's surface. And then transport properties. Fluids can be flowing across folds or maybe up the crust along the folds. Some of you at one point in your career will work with seismic data. Data which were acquired using reflection seismic. And here is a profile. These reflectors represent layers of sediment, for example. And these steps are the faults. And the daily job of many people who work in some kind of an exploration industry is to interpret faults, to draw into the seismic where the faults are so that you can make a three-dimensional geometrical model of the faults. Okay, so now we have heard all these terms, all these attributes. Let's have a look at the very famous and beautiful fault. It is called the Moab Fault. Moab Fault. And this is in Utah, near the town of Moab, a very nice place. And it is located at the entrance of Arches National Park. You can go to the website of Arches National Park and see very, very beautiful pictures. If you look down from this viewpoint, you can see this enormous cliff. And on the right side, the layers are much lower. And the reason for that is that the layers have been offset by a very big normal fault, the Moab Fault, which runs across this valley. To explain this, the people in the Arches National Park have made this beautiful sign which is located in the park. So this is the picture that I've just shown you. And here on the left, you can see the stratigraphy. And here are the layers which were offset by the Moab Fault. So in a very simple representation, the Moab Fault here is a very thin plane, a sharp cut localized deformation which offsets this part against that part. If you go and have a look a little closer, you will find that this black plane here is really an enormous simplification. It is not just a sharp black plane, it is a zone, and it is called the fault zone. So, the next picture is down here, where you can find close to the entrance of the park the fault itself. And what you see is one of these layers here which I've colored black and here's another one which I've colored gray. In fact it is offset by hundreds of small faults. And these small faults culminate in the big fault which is kind of in the middle of this zone. And this zone of small faults around the big fault, it is called the damage zone. The damage zone. So if you would look here, what you find is in fact there are a lot of faults. And maybe here is the offset, and there are lots of offsets here, like this. And this is called the damage zone. If you go a little further, then you can actually find the main fault, the main fault plane. 
and the main fault plane looks like this. Okay, so now I'm looking onto the fault plane. I hope you can see it. And it is full of these lines, these striations. In German, they are called harnish. Okay? And these performed by the motion on this major fault. So this particular plane has had a motion of 100 meter or maybe more. It is quite steep. Yes, here is one of our PhD students for scale. And if you look more closely at this plane, then you see these two pictures. Okay, here on the right side is the block which has moved down, and this itself is the fault plane. And you can see these striations on it, and you can also see a little boulder which has been kind of moved in the fault plane, and it has left this little hole behind it. Okay? Later in your studies, later in your bachelor's uh, lectures, you will learn that you can use these kind of structures to tell which way the fault has moved. And that's very important in the study of faults. So this fault has moved down. It has moved parallel to these striations. And the reason we know that it has moved down is because we know that which layers were offset. But we can also look at the fault plane itself and find structures that tell us what has happened. And this fault plane is really quite thin, OK? Here, this, fault, this photograph is about half a meter wide. And the major jump is across this zone, which is just a few centimeters. And inside this zone, the, the major motion zone, or the fault plane, the rocks are completely ground up and kind of reworked. It is similar to if, if you would take two rocks and rub them together for half an hour, you would find a kind of a rock flower in between. Okay, and that is called the fault gouge. Störungsletten. And some of these fault planes are really extremely sharp. This is from, a, from one of our mapping courses in the Alps, a fault which was formed at maybe 15 to 20 kilometers depth, and it has come to the surface. It was excavated by erosion, and it is, this plane is about 50 meters in size, and it is completely shiny. You can move your hand around it, and it is really completely smooth. And if you go and look closely, it is covered by a thin layer of molten rock. It is um, this molten rock, which was molten by the heat which was generated by the fault motion. It's called a pseudo tachylite. Let me write it down. Pseudotachylite. It is a glass. It is comparable to a volcanic glass, but it can be shown to have formed during an earthquake when the rocks have moved so quickly and under such pressure that the heat of friction has been able to melt the rock. And here is just the final example. This is now from Greece the Gulf of Corinth. This is a surface outcrop of a fault which has actually moved on the surface. And again, you can see the striations on the fault plane very clearly displayed. So fault planes are quite complex. They have this damage zone around them. And sometimes they are really sharp and are covered with a thin layer of glass which was formed during big earthquakes. In fact, pseudo lights are the only way to really prove that a fault has moved seismically at the moment. Scientists are working very hard to find other ways to analyze the motion of fault planes, but at the moment, the only real hard proof for a fault that has moved in the past seismically is the pseudo lights. So,